Dead America, Seattle Part 10 Dead America, The Northwest Invasion Book 12 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 Day Zero Plus 28 The sun had been up for a few hours now, though Captain Kersey and David Frazier wouldn't have known it since they were hunkered down in the windowless communications room at the Klee Elam airport. Multiple radios surrounded the two with several soldiers monitoring them, relaying orders and up-to-the-minute information to troops in the field. For the last thirty hours the captain had been a fixture in this room, poring over every bit of information that came in. David, his communications expert, updated the giant war room map sitting on a table at the back. Kersey was surprisingly alert, despite having been up for days, only catching short fifteen-minute catnaps here and there. But this was the final push towards victory, and even though the Seattle mission was essentially on autopilot at this point, he couldn't pull himself away. Failed building containment herd, one of the soldiers said into his headset. What's your current location? He paused to listen, and Kersey watched his pencil scribble across his notepad. Four-story building, section 47 to the south of the I-90. Confirmed. Size of force? The soldier asked. After a beat, he repeated. Forty outside, unknown number inside. Slow-moving breach. Stand by. The soldier turned to David, who stood at the ready over the map. He'd perked up at the notice of containment failure, and already had his finger over the target. He trailed down to a marked spot just south of the building. Containment breach solution, he said. The soldier nodded. Go. Sweep Team 32 are in the area on store purges, David replied. Redeploy some to deal with it. Heard, the soldier replied with a nod, and turned back to his unit dialing up the sweep team to issue their new instructions. David kept his ears open, listening hard for certain words as the soldiers spoke to the troops in the field. Breach, overrun, runners. All three of those words brought a sense of urgency, and he had to react quickly. One word, however, brought not only relief, but a sense of joy. Barricade formed on the I-5 south of airport another soldier declared. David grinned. Which airport? he asked. International, the soldier replied. The communications expert couldn't stop smiling as he took his bright red marker and drew a line across the interstate to the south of the airport, connecting a previous solid red line from the water of Elliott Bay all the way to the Renton Airport. The latter had been the main hub of the southern barricade for days now, and their position was only strengthening. Cursey, come take a look at this, David said, waving him over. The captain got up out of his chair and walked over, leaning over the table. David pointed to the bright red line running along the entire southern border of Seattle. It joined another at the northern portion of the map. Little green plastic army men stood all along the eastern waterfront in between, creating a massive safe zone. Is that confirmed? Kersey asked, eyes widening. His companion nodded. Triple confirmed, he replied. I even sent one of my drone pilots up so I could fly the length of it. It's solid. Resistance from the south? The captain asked, afraid of the hope blooming in his chest. Minimal, David replied. The southern teams pushing up from Olympia pulled a lot of them their way. So barring some unforeseen circumstance... The southern flank is secure. Kersey let out a huge sigh of relief, nodding and scratching the back of his head. The main portion of the battle was approaching conclusion, and he allowed himself to embrace hope. It wasn't over yet, but it was getting there. How are the teams pushing west looking? he asked. David reached down and picked up one of the little army men that had been positioned at the western coast. Well... As you can see by my state-of-the-art placeholders, they have almost completely cleared the streets within the interior of the safe zone, he explained. We have a couple hundred scouts constantly patrolling the area to make sure we don't have any jailbreaks, and a hundred sweep teams taking out high-priority targets. 
store and weak-looking structures, stuff like that. So far, the trouble has been minimal, with the group we just dealt with being the worst we've had in a while. Kersey stared at the map in silence for several moments, everything imaginable running through his head. Soldiers wiping out zombies, a clear city, civilians able to walk around without worrying about certain death. David, he said slowly, have we actually pulled this off? His companion nodded, putting a hand to his forehead. I think we have, Captain. The two men laughed, shaking their heads, partially in relief and part disbelief that they'd come to this. I'm sorry to interrupt, Captain, a soldier said from behind them, clearing his throat. Kersey turned to him, motioning for him to continue. No, please do, he assured him. What do you have for us? Just got word that they cleared out the horde in front of the stadium by the Coast Guard base, the soldier replied. David punched a victory fist into the air. Liberated the first VIB camp! That's amazing! he cried. Now we just have to hope the people inside are useful to the litany of new issues we're going to be facing, Kersey replied, turning back to the table. I've been talking with Whitney and John from the President's team about that, David said and they seem confident that Captain Galvin did a better job than most. The captain cocked his head playfully. Talking with Whitney and John, huh? he asked. You trying to take my place with the planning? Nothing like that, David replied, chuckling. Just idle chatter, spitballing when we need a break from the mind-numbing invasion planning. Kersey clapped him on the back. I'm just fucking with you, he assured his friend. Although, if you do have any bright ideas on how we can turn this war zone into a home, I'm not going to turn them down. Funny you mention that, David replied, holding up a finger. He headed for his desk and pulled out a giant binder. He held it out and dropped the heavy tome onto the desk with a loud thud. I have had a few thoughts. The captain stared at the thick book, eyes wide. Mother of God, man, he breathed. When did you have time to work on all that? Well, only the last few pages are my ideas, his friend replied, smirking. The rest of this behemoth is the info you're going to need for the next strategy meeting. Kersey shook his head. I was getting ready to say. Pardon me, Captain, the soldier piped up again. But General Stevens is on the line for you. Speak of the devil, David quipped. Kersey pointed to him. Get that binder ready, he instructed. I think we're about to take a trip. He headed over to the radio and picked up a headset. General Stevens. Captain Kersey, Stevens greeted. How are you holding up, my friend? Kersey chuckled. Been running on fumes for the better part of a week now, he admitted, but still kicking. Uh-huh, the general replied playfully. Don't tell me you're back to your old sleep schedule. The captain laughed. You mean going full throttle with the occasional fifteen-minute power blackout? He asked. Yep, that's me at the moment. Oh, to be young and full of energy again, Stevens replied wistfully. I remember those days. Kersey shook his head. I remember those days as well, he agreed. Been a while since either of those things applied to me. Well, if you're anything like me, the general said. The last week has aged you ten years, so you might be right. The captain nodded and pulled up his chair, falling back into it with a sigh. Ain't that the truth, he agreed. So, how are things looking on your side of the battle? Stevens asked. Kersey reached for his mug of lukewarm coffee. We've been in the war room for the last thirty hours or so, keeping track of everything, he reported. As of right now, it looks like we have ourselves a solid, safe foothold here in Seattle. That's what my people are telling me as well, the general replied. In fact, I just heard we've pushed through to the Coast Guard base by the stadium. Seeing as how you played a huge role in making this happen, I wanted to invite you out to the official liberation of the fortress. Kersey glanced over at David as he took a large gulp of coffee and his friend nodded approvingly at him. Absolutely, General, he said into the radio. 
It will be my pleasure. Outstanding, Stevens replied. I have a helicopter on standby that I can send out your way from the ships and pick you up. Before the captain could respond, he noticed David wildly waving his arms. One second, General, he said, and then turned back to his friend. What is it? Benny landed a couple of hours ago, David said with a smirk. He might get a kick out of meeting a general. Kersey barked a laugh, shaking his head as he raised the receiver to his lips. Actually, General, I have a ride already here, he said. Where would you like us to meet you? The Coast Guard base on Elliott Bay would be just fine, Stevens replied. I'll let them know to expect your arrival. The captain nodded, swallowing the last sip of rapidly cooling brew. Look forward to it, he said. We'll be heading out shortly. Guess I should get moving too, the general said. Enjoy the fly-in, Captain. You've earned it. Yes, sir, Kersey replied, and set down the receiver. He beamed with pride, taking a deep breath and allowing himself to enjoy the fruits of all of their hard work. He turned to David, who stood behind him, already holding the giant binder. I'll go wake Benny up, he said. The captain nodded and held up his empty mug. Might want to have some coffee in hand before doing that, he suggested. He seems to be feisty when he doesn't have his fuel. Tell me about it, David replied, rolling his eyes. I had the unfortunate task of getting him up a couple days ago, and I swear it looked like he was trying to stab me. Like, he legit tried to pull something from his waist and thrust it forward. He shook his head. I didn't take it personally, because I thought he was just reacting to a bad dream or something. But the more I think about it... Kersey paused. Yeah, we should probably get some bourbon as well, before waking him up, he said. And the duo shared a chuckle before heading out of the comm room. Chapter 2 Benny piloted the chopper towards the battle zone. Kersey in the passenger seat and David sitting in the back. As they approached the easternmost battlefield, the captain gazed down at the carnage. There were a few small fires burning themselves out, as well as numerous troops in the road, doing patrols and shuffling gear around. Several trucks stood outside of a shopping centre, soldiers loading up goods from inside. They're not wasting any time, are they? Kersey asked into his headset. Benny shook his head. Nah, they sure aren't, Captain, he replied. I swear, half the loads I ran yesterday they pulled right out of the stores and put it right into my baby hair. I can believe it, Kersey agreed. Our Omega stack at the airport was wiped out pretty quick. I know we weren't high up on the totem pole, with most of the stuff going to the front lines, but didn't expect it to go that quick. He peered out at the I-90 bridge that connected with Mercer Island. You doing okay on fuel? he asked. The pilot nodded. Oh yeah, we're good, he replied. Why, you want to take a detour? Can you fly me along the southern border? the captain asked. I just want to see for myself what it looks like. You got it, Benny said, and adjusted course, sending the chopper south to cut across Mercer Island. Kersey looked down and watched a line of trucks moving across the I-90 bridge towards the interior of the safe zone. There were tons of troops moving to the west as well, abandoning the island. As he focused his attention on the far side of the water, his eyes widened at the sight. Tens of thousands of zombies lay dead, stretching for hundreds of yards back from the water. Pile after pile, rotted crimson flesh stacked high, limbs splayed everywhere. Looks like the island diversion worked to plan, he said. Benny nodded. That's an understatement, he replied. I talked to a couple of boys who were with the team coming up behind those things. Said it was like shooting fish in a barrel. Just had to walk up and plug them in the back of the head one by one. Kersey smirked to himself happy that his suggestion had paid off with dividends. As they reached the south of the island, the Renton airport came into view. And if you will look straight ahead, you'll see the Renton airport, home to some of the most ingenious fighting men this country has to offer. 
Benny declared in his best faux airline pilot voice. One Sergeant Farley had the bright idea to combine jet fuel and high explosives, creating one of the biggest bombs I've ever had the pleasure of dropping. The captain blinked at him. Wait, was that the volunteer park bomb? Very same, Benny replied with a grin. Kersey laughed, shaking his head. I'm pretty sure I heard that one back at the airport. That may be, the pilot replied. But you probably didn't hear the smaller five-gallon Molotovs we dropped on the interstate horde down there. The captain looked down and spotted a couple hundred yards of dead bodies on the interstate, charred to a crisp. Benny lowered the chopper down so they could get a good look at just how far the carnage stretched. Far in the distance, Kersey noticed a smattering of zombies, a group no bigger than fifty or so. Even with all that, they're still coming, he said with a sigh. Chances are we'll be clearing those fuckers out for months, Benny replied, but their numbers aren't anywhere big enough to break through. The captain nodded, pursing his lips. Hope you're right, buddy, he murmured. Hope you're right. Benny turned the chopper around and flew back to the main line, flying along it so his passengers could get a good look. At every seat there was a fortified barricade. Most of the time it was made from cars they'd appropriated from local neighborhoods, but every so often there was a larger vehicle like a dump truck, with some chain-link fencing stretched across the roads. Kersey chuckled as he appraised the flimsy fencing. Yeah, we might need to pencil in some more concrete barriers there, he said. Just add it to the shopping list, Benny said brightly, and we'll get around to it. He flew a little further down the line before making the turn north towards the Coast Guard base. Just in the few miles from the line to the base, there was a wide variety of activity around. Several groups had already pushed to the water, others still several blocks away engaged in skirmishes with the dead. In a few cases, groups broke away from the coast and moved back in to reinforce their comrades who were in harm's way. Closer to the Coast Guard base, the stadium loomed in the distance, just on the other side of it. For the last mile or so, there wasn't a zombie in sight on the street, just a huge military presence with tens of thousands of groups roaming the street and clearing the buildings closest to it. Man, they're making a hell of a lot of progress here, Benny said. When I flew over yesterday, they were still a ways off from the water, and now they're half a mile deep in clearing things out entirely. Kersey grinned. Well, they're bringing in heavy hitters like you, buddy, he declared. Can't take any chances after all. The pilot chuckled and shook his head, happy for the playful banter with the familiar passenger. He focused on the base, noting a spot close to the main building that was clear. Not sure if I'm supposed to land here or not, he admitted. But fuck it, what are they going to do? Stop me? Kersey laughed. I got your back, he promised. Have at it. Benny lowered the chopper to the ground, and almost immediately a young soldier came running over, waving his hands in the air frantically. Whoa, whoa! The soldier screamed as Kersey's boots hit the pavement. You can't land that here! The captain raised his hands. Relax, soldier, he said calmly. We're expected. And who are you? The soldier replied. I'm Captain Kersey, came the reply. The young man's eyes went wide as saucers, face white as a sheet. Oh my God, sir, he babbled, waving his hands back and forth in front of his face. I'm so sorry. He scrubbed his fingers down his cheeks. I'm so sorry, sir. Really? Hey, hey, relax, Kersey cut in, taking pity on him. Take a deep breath. The soldier finally bit back his rambling and lowered his arms. Do you know where General Stevens is? the captain asked. Oh, yeah, I can take you to him, the soldier gushed, nodding furiously. Please, follow me. David and Benny approached from behind. Captain, the pilot piped up, you do what you need to do. I'm going to see about scaring up some fuel for my baby here. He jerked a thumb over his shoulder at the big bird. Kersey nodded. If anybody gives you any shit, he said, pointing a finger, you tell them to come talk to me and the general. Love the benefits of having friends in high places, 
Benny declared with a happy sigh, miming tucking his thumbs into pretend suspender straps. Kersey and David chuckled, then followed the young soldier across the base. The place was a flurry of activity, troops setting up barricades, fencing, and machine gun nests. Looks like this is where the military is going to call home, David mused, at least for the time being. Kersey nodded. Makes sense, he agreed. If things go to shit, they can just go straight to the water. The soldier led them into the main building and waved them towards the staircase. Just gotta go up to the second floor, he said. Lead on, Kersey said, sidestepping a few soldiers carrying large pieces of wood to fortify the windows. The hum of power drills and banging of hammers was loud as the troops reinforced the interior of the building, turning it into a hardened position. The second floor was a lot quieter. There were just a handful of soldiers and civilians walking about, with a few offices set up with detailed maps and radio equipment. Looks like they don't care about fortifying this floor, David commented as they walked. Kersey shrugged. Guess they figure if they lose the first floor, anything on the second would just be delaying the inevitable, he mused. Better to be eaten than starve to death, I suppose, David said. Not that I'm very eager to prove that theory. The soldier led them down a hallway to a back office. General Stevens sat behind a desk, reading over reports in several binders strewn across the surface. The soldier knocked on the doorframe. Excuse me, General Stevens, he said gently. These men say they're here to see you. Stevens looked up, his serious expression brightening instantly. Well, 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 he said with a grin. Look what the cat dragged in. He got up from his seat and approached the door as the duo entered, holding out his hand. Been a while, General, Kersey said as they shook vigorously. Stevens nodded. You're telling me, he replied. Last time I saw you back in Kansas, you were just a lowly sergeant. Now look at you, standing here as a captain and dispensing advice to the president. Not bad for a grunt, huh? Kersey replied, and they shared a laugh. The general wagged a finger at him. Don't sell yourself short, my friend, he demanded. You have done your country proud these last few weeks. Hell, you've done the whole damn human race proud. Let's not go too crazy here, General, the captain replied, scratching the back of his head in embarrassment. Stevens raised his chin. I'm being quite serious, he declared. Thanks to your hard work and ingenuity, we now have a foothold to rebuild this country and the world. Communications are sketchy with other nations, but none of what we're hearing is good. But there will be plenty of time to discuss that. He waved a hand. Come, have a seat. Excuse me, General? The soldier by the door piped up as Kersey and David sat in front of the desk. Is there anything you need from me, sir? Stevens glanced at Kersey as he took his own seat. The captain turned towards the door. Can you make sure my pilot Benny gets whatever he needs? Absolutely, sir, the soldier replied, nodding sharply. David raised a hand. And if you could scare up some coffee, I don't think any of us would complain, he added. The soldier's brow furrowed as if confused at how to respond to a civilian request. He glanced at the general for help. Stephen smirked. You heard the man, he said. See if you can find us some coffee. I heard a rumor that they were rigging something up in the break room downstairs. The soldier nodded and hurried away. Once gone, the general held out his hand towards David. Sir, I don't believe we've met, he said politely. If the captain here is bringing a civilian into a meeting with me, I'm going to assume you bring something to the table other than the ability to order drinks. My name is David Fraser, sir, the communications expert replied, shaking Stevens's hand. I joined up with the good captain here back in Spokane and have been with him ever since, coordinating not only the local drone surveillance, but compiling all of the battlefield data. He held up the giant binder and set it on the desk. Stevens pulled it over to him and flipped through it, nodding approvingly. Appears to be some damn fine work, he said. And if you ever want to move up to working with a general, my stuff could use an upgrade. General, 
Are you really trying to poach my communications expert? Kersey asked playfully, cocking his head. Stephen smiled. Of course not, Captain, he replied, folding his arms in front of him. You forget, I'm a general. If I wanted your communications expert here, I would just assign you to an out-of-state mission. Been there once already, Kersey replied with a chuckle. Stevens grinned. Victim of your own success, I'm afraid, he replied. Oh, he held up a finger. Speaking of successes, I have a surprise for you. He picked up a walkie-talkie from the desk and held it to his lips. Kersey and David exchanged an intrigued glance, the former shrugging with no clue what the surprise could be. Mary, can you send in my guest, please? Stevens asked into the radio. He set the device down and nodded to the captain. You're gonna like this. A moment later, there was another knock on the doorframe, and they turned around, laying eyes on Corporal Brett. Holy shit! Kersey cried, launching himself out of his chair. How are you doing, man? Brett's face broke out into a lopsided grin. Little sunburn from hanging out on top of a truck for the better part of the week. But other than that, not too bad, he replied. A week on top of a truck? David blurted, eyes wide. Damn, how did you pass the time? The corporal deadpanned. Trashy romance novels. The other three burst out laughing, but he didn't even crack a smile. No, seriously, he continued when they were finished. Trashy romance novels. Some of the guys that helped us procure the trucks thought it would be a laugh to put those in our care packages. Kersey wiped imaginary tears from his eyes. If you need me to have someone court-martialed for that offense, you just let me know, he said, patting his friend on the shoulder. Actually, some of them were quite entertaining, Brett's admitted laughing. The captain turned to Stevens, brow furrowing in playful concern. General, have you had this man checked out thoroughly for head trauma? he asked. Brett's knocked on his own head. With a skull this thick, I don't think they'd be able to get an accurate reading. There were laughs all around as the two men took seats across from the desk, clapping each other on the back. The soldier returned with a tray of mugs. Here you go, General, he said, focusing on keeping his hands steady. I got enough for everybody. D. He trailed off as he noticed Brett's, and his eyes widened in panic. It's okay, man, the corporal said, waving his hand flippantly. I've already had my fill for the day. The soldier looked relieved, shoulders slumping, and passed out the steaming mugs before scurrying out of the room. So, tell me, Kersey, Stephen said, wrapping his hand around his cup. How was the flight in? All I've seen are reports on how it looks out there. The captain leaned back in his chair. To put it mildly, we're going to need one hell of a cleanup crew, he admitted circling his coffee under his nose. Our troops have done a hell of a job out there. And they're continuing to do so, David added. Those barricades to the south look fierce. Kersey chuckled after taking a sip of coffee. Not sure using a beat-up sedan as a barricade can be considered fierce, but they do have a solid line formed, he said. Not to mention on the interstate, there's a pile of bodies half a mile long. No hordes are going to penetrate that line. Good to know my reports appear to be accurate, Stevens replied, nodding. Our troops are doing some good work. The captain smiled. That they are, General, he replied. That they are. General, David piped up, raising his hand. Any idea how we are looking around the base here? Stevens shook his head. Haven't seen first hand, he admitted. But from what some of the soldiers who helped me get set up here were telling me, they are going full tilt boogie on clearing this area out. Every building, every nook and cranny cleared in triplicate. This base is going to be more secure than Fort Knox. Well, more secure than Fort Knox used to be, Brett's cut in. Has anybody checked on that place recently? The general chuckled. No, but I'll put out an APB on Goldfinger if it'll make you feel better, he said. His radio beeped as the others shared a laugh. Excuse me a moment, he said and picked up the radio. Yes, Mary? 
General, I have just been informed that they are working on the entrance to the stadium, the woman on the other end said. You are being requested to join them. Stevens nodded. Tell them I'm on the way, he replied. Yes, sir, she replied. Oh, and I let the President's team know that there is going to be a delay due to this. They happily rescheduled for an hour from now. The general smiled. You're the best, Mary, he said, and then put the radio down. What do you say, boys? You want to come check out one of our stadium fortresses? Absolutely, Kersey replied, taking a gulp of his brew and getting to his feet. Stevens nodded as he stood up from his office chair. And afterwards, we get another in-depth meeting with the president to find out what other insane task we get to tackle next, he said with a soft groan. Silver lining, though, Kersey countered. You could be one of those civilians who just gets to kick back and enjoy the fruits of our labor. David held up his hand. Yeah, where do I sign up for that one? The quartet shared a chuckle as the general led them out of the building and into the parking lot. A young soldier stood outside of an SUV and stepped forward as they arrived. General Stevens, the young man greeted. I'll be your driver to the stadium. Stevens' brow furrowed. Driver, he said. The stadium is just on the other side of the road there. I think we can manage. Sir, I have my orders to drive you there personally, the soldier insisted. Stevens cocked his head. Did the president give you those orders? Um, the soldier stammered. No, sir. Stevens leaned in a little closer. What about another general? Uh, n no, sir, the soldier replied, starting to sweat now. It was my captain. You know how military ranks work, don't you, son? Stevens asked. The soldier nodded jerkily. Yes, sir. Good, the general replied, clapping his hands. So I'm going to give you new orders. You ought to report back to your captain that the general says he doesn't need a goddamn babysitter to go across the street. And make sure you emphasize the goddamn, because I really want it to resonate. The soldier gaped at him for a moment. Um, okay, he stammered. I mean, yes, sir. Run along now, Stevens demanded, waving him off. Yes, sir. The soldier squeaked and turned away, then back. Oh, and the keys are in the ignition, he added, and then scurried off. Gentlemen, our chariot awaits, Stevens said, and motioned them forward with a flourish. The four men piled into the SUV, and the general fiddled with his seat, moving it into the proper position before flipping on the air conditioning. You boys getting air back there? he asked, glancing in the rear view. Both Bretts and David made noises in the affirmative, and Stevens grinned. All right, let's ride then, he declared, and then hit the gas. He peeled out, screeching the tires as he picked up speed. Kersey chuckled at the genuine look of pleasure on his face as he sped across the lot. They crossed the interstate underpass, and the stadium came into view in the distance. Several snow plows moved limp corpses to the far corners of the lot, clearing the path and setting them up to be disposed of. Heavy machines grabbed stacks of dead bodies and dropped them into garbage trucks that were standing by. That, David shook his head, gagging. That is a horrific sight I probably could have lived without seeing. Bretts took a deep breath. It's going to be a hell of a messy job cleaning this town up, he said. Millions of bodies, and that's on top of battle zones, blood-soaked locations, and a whole hell of a lot more nastiness spread out. Good to see a week in the sun didn't dampen your positive outlook on life, David said dryly. The corporal shrugged. Just calling it like I see it, he replied. We can only hope that some of the VIPs they rescued for the stadium were crime scene cleanup crews. They pulled up in front of the stadium, where a couple of soldiers were in the midst of using an industrial strength blowtorch to cut through the front locks. The quartet got out of the vehicle and headed over, several soldiers stopping to salute the general and captain as they approached. After a moment, the sergeant on sight appeared. General, I'm Sergeant Vice. Thank you for coming, sir, he said, saluting. We almost have this door open. Any word from inside? 
Stevens asked. Yes, sir, Weiss replied. The captain on sight. He checked his notepad. A Captain Galvin is ready to meet you. Stevens nodded. Good, he replied, and then looked around with an eyebrow raised. Do we not have any medical teams on standby? These people have been locked up for a month. They might need some assistance. Yes, sir, the sergeant replied. I have two med teams en route as we speak. Transportation is a bit lacking, so it's taking longer than expected. Stevens nodded. Very good, he said. Thank you. Weiss headed off and the four men stood about twenty yards away from the stadium door. The blowtorch soldiers finally cut through the lock, allowing them to swing open the doors. When they did, they revealed half a dozen soldiers standing there, with one older gentleman at the front of the line. General Stevens, he greeted, stepping forward and saluting with his soldiers behind him. I'm Captain Galvin. The Seattle Fortress is ready for your inspection, sir. Stevens returned the salute and then extended his hand. No need for an inspection, Captain, he assured him as they shook. However, we'll gladly take a guided tour, if you don't mind. Galvin smiled. It will be my pleasure, sir, he said. Right this way. Chapter 3 Galvin led the general and others into the stadium, walking across the outer hallway and into the field portion of the stadium. He pointed to the south along the rim where almost all of the seats had been ripped out of the upper deck and replaced with greenhouses. Several people on the field played touch football, while others threw around a frisbee and a baseball. There was even a yoga class in the visitor's end zone. Welcome to the field, gentlemen, Galvin announced. As you can see, we have kept the majority of it as clear as possible so that the residents here have a place to work out, or just relax. Not everybody is a gym rat, so I wanted to make it a priority the people had space. David pointed to the end zone. Is that a yoga class? Yes, it is, Galvin replied with a smile. Feel free to join if you like. Becky is a great teacher, and she loves breaking in new people. David chuckled, waving a hand in front of his face. I appreciate the offer, but I strain muscles standing up too quickly, he admitted. So I'll take a rain check. Looks like you are doing a good job of keeping them fit, Captain, Stevens piped up. Galvin nodded. Not just fit, sir, but we put a premium on entertainment as well, he explained. We dedicated a small generator to the film room and would run movies for the kids as well as football games for the adults on Sundays, just like they were pre-apocalypse. Even had a few teachers come in with some of the VIPs, so we had them run some fun classes like creative writing. The mixed-media art class was a big hit from what I hear. If you don't mind me asking, Captain, Brett's cut in slowly, why would you spend so many resources on entertainment? Galvin clasped his hands behind his back as they walked. Well. My father was a prison warden, he began. He told me that one of the smartest things he did was to expand the library and activities for the prisoners. The fighting and acting out dropped significantly after he did that. You see, when you're locked up, you don't really have a lot to look forward to, which puts people on edge or makes them just outright lose hope, he explained. Neither of which is an ideal situation when you can't leave the building. While I know this isn't a prison, some people could very well have viewed it as such, so I took his advice to heart. The more we could keep people focused on anything other than the dire situation we were in, the smoother this ride would go. David smiled. Your father sounds like a good man, he said. Nah, he was an alcoholic hard-ass who thought beating the kids with a belt was raising his right. Galvin replied firmly, shaking his head. But... Good advice is good advice. David's eyes widened, and he looked a little embarrassed, and Brett smacked him on the shoulder playfully as they continued following the captain. If you'll give your attention to the upper deck there, you can see our greenhouse farm, Galvin continued, seemingly unperturbed. The sunlight in these parts isn't the greatest this time of year, so it's been a real struggle to grow much of anything. Brett shrugged. 
I'm not the biggest farmer in the world, but it's only been a month, he said. Even in the best cases, you should still be a couple weeks out from harvest, right? While you are correct on that, the captain replied, we were losing a significant portion of the seedlings before they could even begin to grow. In all honesty, if Seattle wasn't picked to play host to the invasion, I doubt very seriously we would have lasted the winter. Stevens held up a hand. David, make a note, he said. We need to bring up the greenhouse issue with the president. If they're having issues with it, other cities might be as well. Consider it done, sir, David replied, scribbling on the back of one of the pages in the binder. I actually speak with Whitney and John on a regular basis, and they're handling the majority of the logistics for supplies. I can let them know if you like. Stephen smiled. Captain Kersey trusts you, which means I trust you, he said sincerely. See that it's done. Yes, sir, David replied. Kersey turned to the captain. What kind of population do you have here? he asked. Two thousand one hundred and forty-two, Galvin replied proudly. I'm sorry. Forty-three, he amended, shaking his head. Had someone give birth to a bouncing baby boy a couple of days ago. And morale? Kersey asked. Galvin shrugged. About as good as can be expected with that many people living in a stadium, eating MREs and stale leftover concession stand food, he replied. How is your VIP list? Stevens asked. Galvin waved to a soldier nearby who came running over with a large notebook holding it out for the general. In there you'll find a list of every VIP, as well as civilian family member and soldier, the captain explained, all listing their skill sets. We have a wide variety of people, doctors, mechanics, a few gunsmiths, even have a couple of honest-to-God blacksmiths. Brett's eyes nearly bugged out of his head. Where in the world did you find blacksmiths in Seattle? he asked. As luck would have it, there was a renaissance fair setting up when this hit, Galvin replied. I figured with the lack of power and supplies, having some people skilled in old school ways might be worthwhile to have. The corporal nodded in appreciation. Good way of thinking about it. The general thumbed through the notebook and then handed it to David before looking at his watch. David, please look this over before the meeting with the president, he instructed. Might need to call on you for some information. The communications expert blanched, blinking at him. You, you want me in the meeting with the president? He gaped. Outside of Captain Kersey here, Stevens explained. I'm guessing you know more about our current situation than anyone else. Plus, they're on the other side of the country, so there's not a damn thing they can do about my decision to have you in the room, now is there? David couldn't help but smirk at the plucky general. No, sir, I guess there's not, he admitted. Captain Galvin, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave you to it, Stephen said, turning back to him. We have another meeting to attend. Is there anything I can do for you? Galvin shook his head. No, sir, I believe we're all set here, he said with a smile, and then slowly raised a finger. Although, I do have one request. Let's hear it, Stephen said. My people here are a little hesitant to rush back out into the world, the captain explained, especially with a week's worth of fighting going on with an earshot. If it's all the same to you, I would like permission to allow them to stay in the stadium for the next few days, at least until the constant gunfire has died down for a bit. Stevens nodded. I think that would be best, Captain, he agreed. In fact, I'm not sure what the housing plan even is yet. Frankly, I'm not sure anybody has thought that far ahead. Well, if you need a place to bet down for the night, Galvin replied, I'll set you up in one of the VIP suites. The general chuckled, shaking his head. Almost afraid to ask what that consists of. We renovated the corporate skyboxes and turned them into getaway cabins, the captain explained. Use it as a reward for when people went above and beyond around the stadium. Stephen smiled. I'll keep that in mind, he replied. Thank you, captain. He turned back to his companions and rolled a hand above his head. Well, boys, shake a leg. Can't keep the president waiting. Chapter 4
Kersey and Stevens sat at a small desk with a satellite phone sitting in the center of it. David and Brett sat just behind them against the wall. Mary entered with a tray of bottled water and set it down on the desk. Sorry, it's not chilled, she said. David chuckled. Not your fault these slackers haven't gotten the power back on yet, he said playfully. It's been a whole forty-five minutes since they took over the city. I think they're getting lazy, don't you? He gave her a wink and she laughed, waving her hand at him. Be careful there, David, Kersey teased. Last time I made a joke, the general here put me on a train and sent my ass halfway across the country. Stephen stared coolly at the communications expert. I'll do it again, too. David started to laugh, but it fizzled out when he realized the general was still deadpanning. Oh, he stammered. Uh, I'm sorry. Kersey and Stevens couldn't hold back any longer and burst into laughter as David's face went crimson and he shook his head in relief. It's good to know you can still go into put the fear of God into them mode at the drop of a hat, Kersey gasped through gales of giggles. Stevens caught his breath and clapped his friend on the back. Pretty sure it's in the promotion requirements to be a general. If not, it really should be, the captain replied, shaking his head. The phone in the center of the table clicked on, and a friendly male voice greeted them. General Stevens, are you there? We are, Stevens replied, getting comfortable in his chair as he unscrewed the cap of one of the water bottles. Please hold for the president, the man said. There were a few clicks, and then he continued. Mr. President, I have General Stevens. Thank you, President Williams said. General Stevens, how are you getting set up in your new office? The general swallowed a swig of water before replying. Very nicely, sir. Thank you. Have a nice view of Elliott Bay, and some enterprising young soldier figured out a way to get the coffee maker going. So, life is good. Fresh coffee, and of you, Williams replied. So how does it feel to have a better situation than the president? Stevens laughed. Don't tell me they didn't stock up the pantry before all this went down, sir, he joked. There's still some coffee left, but supplies are a little lower than I would prefer, the president replied. Contemplating sending General Adams here out on a store run. There was some laughter through the line, and then Adams added, There will be a shopping request sheet by the front vault door. If it's any consolation, General, Stevens piped up, we are fresh out of creamer, so we're roughing it out here. Adams chuckled. That wouldn't affect me because I take my coffee like I take my women, he replied. Cold and bitter. There was more laughter on the line. As much as we would love to unpack General Adams' coffee comment, Williams cut in, sighing through his own mirth, we do have a lot to get to today. There was a smattering of yes, sir, throughout the line. General Stevens, on my side of the line, I have General Adams, Whitney Hill, and John Teeter, the president continued. Stevens leaned forward in his chair. Good morning, everyone, he greeted. I'm joined by Captain Kersey. Listening in to the call is Corporal Bretts and civilian David Frazier. Pardon the interruption, Adams cut in. But should we have a civilian not in the presidential bunker on this call? We know the people in this room aren't talking to anybody. General, I've been working with David closely over the last couple of weeks, Whitney piped up, closely coordinating troop movements and supplies. He's a valuable resource. Kersey nodded, leaning in. And to be frank, he probably knows more about the inner workings of the logistics than anybody else in this room, he added, myself included. All right, Adams said quickly. I withdraw my objection. Let's move on. Williams cleared his throat. So, if it's okay with the rest of you, I'd like to start with the big picture. How are we looking in Seattle? There were a few moments of silence, and then he clucked his tongue. Please, don't everybody start talking at once, he joked. There was some laughter on both sides, and then Whitney piped up. Okay, I'll kick things off. Our stronghold in Seattle is protected by water to the west, and our forces who marched in through the east. Our two big concern areas were to the north and south. There was a shuffling of paper, and then a click. Now I know that you can't see our screen over the phone, so I'll give it the best description I can for you. At the beginning of the invasion, we had a real concern about a significant number of zombies coming down from Vancouver. After receiving permission from those in the Canadian government, 
at least those we could locate, we launched a strike on the main bridges leading south of the city. As you can see by the satellite imagery, this was a wise move. There are an estimated 150 to 200,000 zombies that have found their way to the water's edge, drawn by the noise. Pardon the interruption, Williams cut in, but can they really hear our bombs going off that far north? Indirectly they can, John answered. Think of it like standing on a football field and there's someone every 20 yards. One person in the end zone yells something out, which is repeated by everyone down the line. The last person didn't hear the first person yell, but he knows that he did. Similar situation here. Although there's a good chance our missiles taking out the bridge account for a lot of the mass. Point taken, the President replied. Please, Miss Hill, continue. Thank you, Mr. President, Whitney said and cleared her throat. Now, even though the worst of our fears weren't realized, we have still faced a significant, albeit manageable, threat. Stretching around fifty miles on the interstate are an estimated twenty thousand zombies. They are slowly working their way towards our northernmost barricade in Burlington. What are we doing to mitigate this? Williams asked. Over the last couple of days we have been able to move up a couple thousand troops to that position, Whitney continued, and have begun doing hit-and-run operations to thin their numbers. The President made a small noise of confusion. Hit-and-run operations? Yes, sir, she replied. Setting fire traps, using abandoned cars as makeshift IEDs, things of that nature. We're still expecting several thousand to eventually reach the barricades on the bridge, but those numbers are very manageable. There was another click as she changed the screen they were watching on the other end. Shifting to the south, we have successfully set up a barricade running from the water all the way across through the residential areas east of Renton. The airport is secure, and we have reinforcements being moved in via the water to back them up. On the interstate, we have several heavy machine gun lines set up, and a buffer of several hundred yards. What kind of buffer? Williams asked. She paused. Corpses. There was a short silence, and then he continued. Seems a little morbid, don't you think? Morbid, yes, Whitney confirmed. Effective, absolutely. Those things have problems traversing uneven terrain, and thanks to some aerial strikes, there is a whole lot of uneven terrain impeding their advancement. Would enough of a force be able to push through it? Adams piped up. Possibly, she replied, but their numbers have been split thanks to our Olympia crew. There was another click, and then she continued. A few days ago, we breached a ship to the west of Olympia. Those couple thousand troops were able to establish a beachhead and push forward to Olympia. Since then, they have launched numerous operations to draw the enemy in their direction, which has helped the northern group secure the line. Any word on how that group is faring? Williams asked. John cleared his throat. Yes, my team spoke with them this morning, he replied. The majority of the troops are set up in defensive positions to hold the attention of the crowds. They do have a few roving teams that are still active and bringing in more zombies, but they're unsure of how long they'll be able to keep that up. Are they in any immediate danger? The president asked, and then immediately continued. Sorry, let me rephrase, as everybody outside is in immediate danger with those things. He took a deep breath. Are they in need of immediate assistance? Or can they sit tight for a few days before we send in a rescue team to relieve them? By all accounts, they are set up for a few days, John replied. They're secure and they have plenty of rations to ride it out. Okay, good, Williams said. General Stevens, if you wouldn't mind making this a priority once the situation becomes more stable in the safe zone. I don't want to leave those troops exposed any longer than necessary. Stevens nodded. Yes, sir, he replied and took a sip of his water. Miss Hill, Adams piped up, has there been any update on the Portland Horde? I know there were concerns about that group on the interstate coming north. Yes, she replied, and there were more shuffling papers as she continued. Our diversion tactics worked well. Virtually every zombie on the interstate started moving south after our bombing run. That is fantastic news, Adams commended. Well, it is fantastic news for our southern flank, Whitney agreed. However, we saw something of a concern on our last scan. More clicks. One of my team members noticed this, and they are confident that it wasn't there before the strike. There was a long pause, and then William said, Forgive me, Miss Hill, but I'm having a difficult time understanding what I'm seeing here. We did too at first, she replied. Our working hypothesis is that these metal contraptions on the road were able to take out a significant number of zombies. As you can see, 
There is a radius around each device that is clear of corpses. They appear to be lawn mowers with metal rods welded to them like helicopter blades. So, what you take away on that? The president asked. We believe that there were survivors in this area that were forced out due to our bombing run, Whitney replied. Everyone on both sides of the call fell silent. I was under the impression we weren't targeting civilians with this strike, Williams finally said. Mr. President, John spoke up slowly. We used every bit of intelligence we had to do our best to aim away from the populated areas, or what we assumed were populated areas. The surrounding area is heavily wooded, so it's entirely possible that we missed a settlement. To be blunt, without direct contact or eyes on the ground, we wouldn't have any idea they were there. Williams sighed heavily. Okay, I understand. He murmured and then cleared his throat. General Stevens, I hate to continue to add to your workload, but can you please add sending assistance to Portland when you have a chance? Yes, sir, Stevens replied, nodding. Once we get Olympia squared away, I will send a team down there to investigate. Thank you, General, Williams replied. Okay, is there anything else with the broad strokes, or can we get into the nitty-gritty of the safe zone? There was a moment of silence, and then he continued. All right, moving on. Does anybody have an update on clearing the buildings within the safe zone? General Stevens, does anybody on your end have a figure on this? John asked. I know that we have had teams operating since the beginning of this, but with the ebbs and flow of battle, I imagine some teams were repurposed during the assault. Stevens turned in his chair and smiled. I believe David is going to be the best one to answer this question. The man in question stared at him with wide eyes, like a deer caught in headlights. Brett smacked him on the back and pointed to the desk. David scurried forward, white-knuckling the binder, and Kersey got up, offering his chair. He sat down beside Brett's, just as David fumbled the binder, sending it down onto the desk with a loud smack. Oh my God, I'm so sorry about that, Mr. President, he said hoarsely. Williams chuckled. It's all right, son, he replied. Take your time and get settled. Thank you, sir, David gushed, and then took a deep breath, pouring through some pages before finally clearing his throat. Okay. During our push west, we had roughly a thousand troops that were tasked solely with structure clearing. Most of the time they were used when the main force came across a breach. His voice became calmer and more businesslike as he fell into the zone of reporting information. If the building could be patched up securely, they did that but more often than not, they had to clear it. As you can imagine, this is a slow, tedious task. Right now, in the safe zone, we have teams of scouts scouring the area, keeping watch for breaches so that teams can move in. I think we can all agree that the last thing we need are runners showing up in the safe zone. There was a chorus of emphatic noises in the affirmative. David, do you have a timeline on how long it's going to take to completely clear these things out? Williams asked. The communications expert shook his head. That's impossible to say at this point, sir, he replied honestly. Please, son, humor me, the president said gently. Give me your best guess. I promise I won't hold you to it. David chewed his lip. Okay, um, he said, tilting his head back and forth. For the immediate downtown area, say one mile out from the Coast Guard base, we're looking at a few weeks. From north to south, barrier lines stretching completely across the occupied area? Months. Months? Williams exclaimed. How is that possible? We just marched through over a million of those things in the span of a week. Now you're telling me it's going to be months before we get the structures cleared out? David winced but nodded. In order to do it safely, yes, sir. Would you care to go into a little more detail there? The president asked. Because I'm still not fully understanding why it could take that long. Gladly, sir, the communications expert replied, forcing his voice to stay steady. In talking with Captain Kersey, Miss Hall, and John, we determined that the safest way to clear a structure was to have triple redundancy. Triple redundancy? Williams asked dryly. That's correct, sir, David replied quickly. Let me give you an example. On a standard two-story family home, we would have a clear team of six. These six, in teams of two, would move in and sweep the house of hostiles. For safety reasons, just outside of the exits would be another team of six covering every way that a runner could escape. Out of the street would be another team in a vehicle, ready to strike. 
Now this team would have the ability to cover more than one house at a time, since their main job would be to alert everyone else in the unlikely event of a runner. But they would still need to be there. That seems like a bit of overkill, don't you think? Williams asked, skepticism evident in his tone. Kersey leaned forward in his seat, lacing his fingers together in front of him. Mr. President, Captain Kersey here, he cut in. If anything, we aren't being cautious enough. Runners are an extremely dangerous problem, and if some of them got loose within the safe zone, it could be catastrophic. I understand fully that it's time-consuming and uses a lot of manpower, but to be frank, we've spilled an enormous amount of blood just to get to this point. It would be a shame to have all that go to waste because we didn't go the extra mile with safety. There was a moment of silence before Williams replied, I understand that point of view. It's easy for me to question the validity of these safety procedures when I'm locked up safely in a vault, he admitted. You do what you feel you need to do to execute the mission successfully and safely. Thank you, sir, Kersey replied, and leaned back in his seat. If someone on your team wouldn't mind, Williams continued, please provide us with daily updates on the progress. The captain nodded, picking up his bottle of water and unscrewing the cap. Absolutely, sir, he said. We will keep you in the loop. Moving on, the president said. I just thought of a question on this topic that brings up another more pressing question. What is our current force size? I was just wondering if we could allocate more troops to the structure clearings, and it dawned on me that I have no idea what our force strength is. There was a long pause, and Kersey raised an eyebrow. David, I hate to do this to you, he said with a chuckle but you probably have the most up-to-date information. David nodded, flipping through his binder to several pages with handwritten figures on it. Okay, I need to preface this before I start diving into the numbers, he began running his finger across the page. My small team of four and I have been trying to process this data in real time, along a thousand other variables, and... He paused, chewing his lip. I'm sorry, but this is going to come off as callous, but I honestly don't mean it as such. It's okay, Stephen said. You just lay out the facts. Nobody's going to hold it against you. David nodded and took a deep breath. The other variables were things like troop movements and reacting to real-time threats, so they were more important than compiling the deaths, he said, wrinkling his nose at his choice of words. Please understand that every death hurts, and every time I had to take a report, I felt it. But there simply wasn't time to mourn. We had to keep moving forward. Son... I've been in battle, as have several other people on this call, Adams assured him. We understand that mentality completely. We've been there. David's shoulders relaxed a little. Thank you, General, he said, and took a deep breath. Okay, on to the numbers. When this operation started, we had approximately 165,000 troops, and another 25 to 30,000 on the ships. To make life easy, let's call it 190. Now, communication has been spotty with some teams, and there has been a lot of chaos in some of these battles, especially when runners break free. But as of right now, our best guess as far as casualties go is somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. There was a long pause, the horror palpable on both sides of the call. Son, I don't mean to discount your numbers, Williams said slowly, but are you 100 percent sure on that? David licked his lips. I'll admit, Mr. President, there is a fair amount of assumptions and guesswork in these numbers, he replied, but I erred on the side of caution when compiling these. Confirmed dead was easy enough to add, but there were a lot of teams that simply lost contact. On rare occasions, it was equipment malfunctions, but most of the time it was because whoever had the radio in the group fell in battle. In these cases, I implemented a 25% rule. Would you care to explain on that? Williams asked. David nodded. Certainly, sir, he replied politely. If there were, let's say, eight people in a squad and they fell off of the radar, I used the 25% rule and assumed that two of them were KIA. We heard more than enough stories over the previous week of positions that were completely overrun, only for survivors to find a place to lay low, or they made it to another squad. Sadly, though, based on the number of runner reports we've processed, my 25% rule may be wildly optimistic. Stephen scribbled away at a piece of scrap paper and then raised his hand. So, using some rough calculations, he spoke up, our best case scenario is that we have 150 to 160,000 troops here. 
Now keep in mind this doesn't include those involved with the caravan project, or the ones that are still stationed overseas. But this is what we have to work with in the safe zone. That's going to be a lot of mouths to feed long term, Adams piped up. Not to mention getting them sheltered. There's only so many nights that they can spend outside. And that doesn't even include the civilians, John added. Do we have an accurate number on them yet? Williams asked. My team was compiling those numbers before the meeting, Whitney replied. If we can break for just a moment, I can confer with them and get you that answer. There was a shuffling of papers and the president said, Okay, let's reconvene in ten. Chapter 5 Corporal Bretts, are you still in the room? Williams asked, leaning forward and resting his arms on the conference room table. There was a shuffle through the speaker in the center. Yes, Mr. President, I'm here, Bretts replied, sounding confused. Williams inclined his head to his companion to his right. General Adams here just informed me that you were the leader of that truck caravan group that tried to block off the northern interstate when this whole thing kicked off, he said. Yes, sir, that's correct, the corporal replied. Well, son, I got one question for you, Williams declared. How in the hell do you walk around with balls that big? Laughter erupted in the room and over the speaker, and then Bretts finally said, Well, sir, when you've had them as long as I have, you just kind of get used to them. You did a hell of a job out there, the president said. Not a lot of people would have volunteered for a job like that. Quite frankly, sir, it needed doing, Bretts replied, and my team and I gave it our best shot. Williams nodded, lacing his fingers on the table. When you talk to your team, he said, will you please give them my personal thanks? Their actions saved a lot of lives and made it a lot easier for our troops to march west. I'll do that, sir, the corporal replied. Whitney entered the room, arms full of clipboards and random stacks of papers. Sorry about the delay, everyone, she said as she took her seat, frantically organizing all of her sheets. I just wanted to make sure I had the right numbers. No problem, Miss Hill, William said, motioning to her. Please, proceed when you're ready. She plucked the right paper out of her pile and then pulled a USB drive out of her pocket, heading for the television against the wall and plugging it into the back. She picked up her remote and pulled up an image. The screen came to life showing a satellite view of the downtown Seattle area that stretched out in a 50-mile radius. There were a hundred or so red dots on it, with a high concentration around the edges. The dots on this image represent roughly where we have located survivors, Whitney explained. A fair number of them are individuals who managed to barricade themselves inside their homes or businesses, and had enough resources to ride this thing out. Some are small clusters of people who did the same. In a few cases, like the dots in the park area to the west of town, we have located small communities of people who have been roughing it in the wild for the last month. Adams leaned forward as he studied the screen. And we've brought these people in already? Only the ones we've come across while pushing west, Whitney replied, shaking her head. Some of our helicopter pilots have spotted the wilderness communities and have delivered messages that we'll be getting to them soon. Williams nodded, raising a hand. Do we have an estimate on how many civilians? he asked. Like everything else these days, it's just an educated guess, she replied but we're looking at the five to seven thousand range. The room fell silent at the words. Kersey cleared his throat on the other end. Five to seven thousand survivors? In a town of four million? He said slowly. I don't even know what to say to that. Miss Hill, Stevens asked. Is it possible there are other civilians we haven't located yet? Whitney nodded, turning towards the speaker. Yes, she said but none of us on my team feels like it's going to bump the numbers up all that much. Have any efforts been made to locate survivors in smaller communities? Adams asked, brow furrowing. Fewer people could mean a better chance at survival. She clasped her hands in front of her. It's not on our list, sir, she confirmed, and I have one person on my team whose sole mission is to scope out these locations and figure out a game plan to reach them. However, we have a lot more pressing issues to deal with before bringing more people into the fold the two most important being housing and supplies. Out of those two, the housing aspect is going to be the easiest, John piped up, tapping on a notepad in front of him. 
We have located every downtown hotel and condo building and have made that our top priority to clear out first. The weather is already cooling and it's not going to be much longer before sleeping outside isn't an option. Williams nodded, cocking his head. Do we have a timeline on getting enough beds for everyone? Short term, we should have enough beds on a rotating basis within a week, John replied. That's going with a 12 hours on, 12 hours off shift schedule. Although, that's not going to be the best conditions. The president's brow furrowed. What do you mean? The water in these buildings may or may not work, John explained. And if it does, they certainly don't have hot water. We don't have staff or a way to keep these rooms clean. And to veer into a gruesome yet necessary problem, a lot of people died in these rooms. And I don't mean they passed in their sleep. He shook his head. Until we get in there and see what we're dealing with, I won't have an accurate timeline on getting things up to snuff. Williams sighed. Are there any other options? He asked, spreading his arms. Moving some troops out to the suburbs where we've cleared it out? The troops on the front lines of the barricades are already taking care of that for themselves, John replied with a nod. They have enough houses to pick from that I don't think it'll be an issue for them. It's not viable to have interior troops that are working out from the Coast Guard base to commute to the suburbs for rest, because fuel, like everything else, is going to be a major issue in procuring. Williams drummed his fingers on the conference table. Guess this is as good a time as any to start discussing our supply situation, he prompted. Pardon me, Mr. President, David said earnestly from the other end of the phone, but I do have a bit to add to the sleeping arrangements before we move on. Williams motioned to the speaker and then shook his head when he remembered the young man couldn't see him. By all means, David, he said. When the invasion first began, we put together scavenging teams that specifically targeted stores that had food as well as ammunition. The communications expert began. Most of the time, the ammunition was in sporting goods stores. Just about every single one of these places is going to have a robust camping section, especially in this area of the country. While it's not going to be enough to give everyone winterized protection, we should be able to cobble together several thousand tents and sleeping bags. John nodded thoughtfully. David, if you can send me over an inventory list and where it's at, I'll start coordinating with the transport teams to get them where they need to go, he suggested. You'll have it as soon as we're done here, David replied. John scribbled on his notepad. Thank you. So, let's talk supplies, Williams said, clasping his hands together. I know there is a lot to get to, so let's focus on the basics first. Then we can move on from there. Off the top of my head, the three most important are food, water, and warmth. Who wants to start us out? I will, sir, Stephen said through the speaker. Our MRE situation is pretty dire. Even going two meals a day, we will deplete our stock within the week. Once those are gone, then they're gone for good. Because we don't have the production capacity to make more. Williams pursed his lips. What about local sources of food? He asked. I do have some reports from my scavenging teams on the grocery stores. Just need to... David trailed off, and there was the shuffling of papers through the phone. Found it. Okay, so my teams were more concerned with ammo than food, but they have inventoried a dozen grocery stores, so this will give us a rough idea of what we can expect. The fresh product is all but gone, especially since the power went out. The potatoes should be fine, but that's going to be about as far as the fresh food goes. And how is the non-fresh situation looking? Stevens asked. Canned goods like beans and soups will be fine, David replied, as will dried pasta and ramen. Living off ramen, Kersey cut in. It's like college all over again. There was some light chuckling on the other end, and even the president joined in, rubbing his forehead. Or adult life if you like me, David quipped. But I digress. Luckily, we're in a heavily populated area, so most of these stores are going to be well stocked. On top of that, virtually every house, apartment, and restaurant is going to have a stockpile of goods that we can procure. Williams took a deep breath. David, give me your best guess, he said. Just on canned and dried goods. How long can we sustain nearly 200,000 people? There was a long pause, and then David cleared his throat. Based on the numbers I'm seeing and doing a whole lot of guesswork when it comes to what we're going to find in restaurants and homes. More shuffling papers. If we go with a strict rationing, I'm talking 1,500 calories a day diets, we might be able to stretch it six months? Adams balked, shaking his head. 1,500 calories a day? 
he demanded. That's not even going to keep our troops at their current weight, especially given their exertions. I understand that, General, David replied quickly. And if we need to up the calorie count on a limited basis to those doing the most work, I'm sure that can be arranged. But every day we're above that 1,500 calorie average. It's one less day we have on the calendar to get a sustainable source of food. Adams crossed his arms, but then nodded begrudgingly. Williams waited to make sure he had nothing else to say, and then looked around the room. Does anybody have any idea what needs to be done to create a sustainable source of food for the community? He asked. In the short term, we need to get as many greenhouses up and operational as we can, Kersey spoke up. I'm not a farmer, but from what I understand it can take three to four months to start harvesting. That's cutting it close. There are more than enough hardware stores in the region that we should have the raw material to make that happen, David added. We just need to make sure we pick the correct areas to build them in, as they're going to need sunlight, Kersey continued. The stadium fortress was having issues with their setup because the sun doesn't get very high in the sky this time of year. John nodded, scratching his chin thoughtfully. I know generator usage isn't going to be practical given the fuel situation, but what about bike power generators? He suggested. We literally have an army of fit human beings. We should be able to power lights, shouldn't we? I think it would be more practical to use that manpower to take over the power stations and get them up and running, Kersey continued. But we can get into that once we're done with the supply issues. John raised a palm, conceding. Agreed, he said. What about local farms? William suggested. Surely there have to be some farmers up there. Planting season has passed and won't be around until March, David explained, which is right around the time we'll be running out of food. Whitney crossed over to her seat and scribbled on her notepad. I'll have my teams do sweeps of the area to locate the farms, she said. At the very least, we can spend the next few months preparing for planting season. I have a question, Adams cut in, raising a hand. Do we have anybody that knows a damn thing about farming? It's one thing to plant some tomatoes in the backyard, but it's another thing entirely to create a sustainable food source for 200,000 people. Based on my experience, General, there are a lot of people from the heartland who are in the military, Kersey replied. I'd be willing to bet that some of them grew up on farms. The president leaned forward. General Stevens, as soon as this meeting is concluded, I want you to start pulling anybody with farming experience off of the line and keep them protected, he declared. To put it bluntly, we can give anybody a weapon to fight, but specialized people are going to be hard to come by. Yes, sir, Stevens replied. I will start pulling them immediately. There was another shuffle of papers through the phone speaker, and then David said, We may not be totally in the dark after all. I just looked at the census that Captain Galvin gave us when we opened up the stadium, and it looks like there are half a dozen farming families safely within the walls. Williams nodded. General Stevens, let's build off of that, he suggested. Have the troops you locate coordinate with the farmers so we can get some food growing. Yes, sir, Stevens replied. Whitney held up her palm. David, before we move on, she said quickly, can you get me a copy of that list? I won't need names. I just need to know how many of what we have at our disposal. You got it, David replied. Williams nodded appreciatively at her. Please keep us up to date on the progress of the greenhouses and farms, he said to the phone. But for now... Let's move on to the next major concern, fresh water. We have located several water treatment facilities, including some close to downtown, Whitney reported, running a finger down her list. These places are mostly automated, so it's just going to be a matter of getting the power back on to get them operational again. Adams took a deep breath. Even so, we're still going to need people who know how to operate these things, he reminded her, as well as keeping the pipes clear so the water keeps flowing. If I might add... Kersey piped up. In addition to the fresh drinking water, I think it would be nice to have a functioning restroom situation. Because to put it bluntly, 200,000 people can create a whole lot of shit. Not going to take long for the stench to become overwhelming. I don't know, Captain, Stevens countered. Might be a welcome change from the stench of death in the air. John shook his head, stifling a smile. Without debating the merits of which smells worse, this does bring up another point, he said. What are we going to do with the millions of dead bodies? Just leaving them be will create a whole host of problems aside from the stench. They were loading them into dump trucks from outside the stadium, David replied. But I don't think that's going to be a viable solution for the city given the fuel situation. Adams nodded. That's a good point, but let's table the fuel situation for the moment, he said. Realistically, 
what can be done with that many bodies. Sadly, the only two viable options are mass graves and burning, Kersey said. And with our fuel situation, I don't think burning is going to be possible. Williams pursed his lips for a moment. David, please add two things to your list, he finally said. Please collect every shovel and manual digging instrument you can find, and coordinate with Miss Hill's team about the best spots for mass graves. There was a thick silence as the overwhelming thought of burying the entire town of Seattle sank over everyone like a stone. I'll get it done, sir, David finally said, voice a touch hoarse. The president pressed his palms down on the conference table. Okay, on to the next major issue, he said, blowing out a deep breath. How are the military supplies looking? I know the MRE situation isn't good, but how are we looking elsewhere? The fuel situation is dire, to say the least, Stevens replied. The consumer-grade vehicles can utilize local gas stations and stay operational, at least for a while, but when it comes to aviation, we're in trouble. Adams's brow furrowed. Exactly how bad are we talking, Stevens? he asked. With what we have on the ships and airports we control, the general replied, we have about forty hours of flight time for our helicopters remaining. A little less if we're transporting something heavy. The planes are even worse, with about twenty hours of flight time remaining on those. Williams looked to Whitney. Is it possible to take over some other airports in the region? We have a list of small regional airports, she replied with a nod. But for the most part, we'll burn as much fuel getting to them as we'll find there. In my opinion, we should leave them be so that if we have to do longer runs to Portland or beyond, we'll have a spot to refuel and extend our range. I agree with Miss Hill, Stevens said. Having the ability to stretch our range is a lot more valuable than having a couple more tanks of gas here. Williams shook his head. What about the oil fields in Canada? He asked. Wasn't that one of the main reasons we picked Seattle as an invasion point? We are coordinating with the Canadian government to secure the fields and get workers up there again, John confirmed. We also have our eye on processing facilities on the U.S.-Canada border that we can utilize. The problem there is we still have a significant zombie infestation problem that will need to be dealt with. The president shrugged. Well, we certainly have the manpower to handle that, he said, looking around. Don't we? Manpower, Stevens replied. Absolutely. Ammunition is going to be an issue, however. Williams pursed his lips. How big of an issue? We expended a lot of rounds to secure the city, Stevens explained. We've allocated a significant number of rounds to the soldiers manning the lines. Essentially, two bullets for every suspected zombie that we may encounter. Adams leaned forward. What are the reserves looking like? he asked. Undistributed rounds, Stevens replied, dragging out the word for a moment as he thought. If we're lucky, maybe half a million rounds, with ten percent of that being for the heavy weapons. John rubbed his forehead. Not sure how much damage we're going to be able to do with every soldier getting three and a half rounds apiece, he said dryly. David? Whitney spoke up. How are the stores looking for ammunition? Ninety-five percent is consumer-grade stuff, the communications expert replied. Nine mil, shotgun shells, and enough twenty-two ammo to fill the stadium. A twenty-two isn't going to have much stopping power, Kersey admitted. But in the right hands, it could be a viable weapon. Adam shook his head. Still not ideal to be sending our troops into a massive confrontation with, he said gruffly. Williams looked around the room, eyes searching. So, what can be done about this? he asked. First thing we need to do is collect every spent casing we can come across, Whitney replied. There should be hand loaders and raw materials in gun shops and elsewhere. It's not going to be a huge score, but bullets are going to be scarce. We need to salvage every single one we can. We should also add distribution warehouses to our lists of places to check, David added. The internet delivery ones probably won't have anything, but the big box stores just might. John nodded, pointing his pencil at the speaker. Should probably check there for food and other goods as well. Miss Hill, David said. If your team can get us a list of potential targets, I'll get teams sent out there. She nodded, scribbling on her notepad. I'll send over what I can. Williams nodded and took a deep breath. So, what else can we do on the ammunition front? he asked. Because while salvaging and scrounging for rounds is good, 
We're going to need something bigger. Mr. President, I do have a plan for this, Stevens piped up. But I need a little more time to work on it before presenting it, just to make sure it's viable. Can we schedule a short meeting this evening to discuss it? Williams blinked and shrugged. Of course, General, he replied, and then looked down at his list of topics. Let's move on to... power. Who has something on this? Sir, my team has located every power plant serving the greater Seattle area, Whitney replied. Every one of them, save one, is a hydro plant. Assuming the person in charge of the stadium was smart enough to protect some power plant workers, it shouldn't be a big deal to get the lights back on in a reasonable amount of time. According to the ledger, David added, there are a dozen people with power plant experience. Whitney smiled and motioned to the phone. Well, there you go, she said. Williams nodded. If everything is hydro except one, what's the last remaining plant? he asked. Nuclear, Whitney replied, and the tension was palpable. After a few beats, Williams asked, Is it in any danger of melting down? John shook his head. Unlikely, he replied calmly. These plants have multiple failsafes that keep them secure in case of a catastrophic event, such as them going unmanned during a zombie apocalypse. That said, these failsafes do have an expiration date, usually within six to eight weeks, and every day past that puts them in danger. Where is this one located? Williams asked. Whitney tapped her pencil on her notepad. To the west of Olympia, she replied. Reports on the ground say that the area is partially secured. So, hopefully, within the next few days, we can get people in there to look it over. Please, just for my own mental well-being, make this a priority, Williams said, holding up both of his palms. We already have a zombie infestation. The last thing we need is to go all 50s monster movie and have radioactive zombies as well. There was some light chuckling, though more than a few of his comrades couldn't help but picture the devastation a nuclear meltdown could cause. Yes, Mr. President. Stevens replied. I'll make that a priority. Adams crossed his arms. This does bring up another question, though, he said. What about the other nuclear plants around the country? There are a total of 58 plants nationwide, John replied. Williams blinked at him, chewing his lower lip. What's the likelihood that we could reach them all and shut them down before they risk going into meltdown? He asked. Honestly, sir, not good, John admitted. We might have the manpower on the ground thanks to the caravan groups, but they're not going to have the experts on hand to shut them down. Is it possible for the power plant experts to draw them up a plan? Kersey asked, like a guide to shutting them down safely. John shook his head thoughtfully. I'll be honest, I have no idea, he admitted. I'll have Captain Galvin convene a meeting with them right after we're done here, Stevens suggested. We can address it at this evening's meeting. Williams pressed his palms together. Time is of the essence, General, he said. Why don't we take five so that you can go ahead and relay that message to him? That way they'll have an answer for you by the time you get over there. As you wish, Mr. President, Stevens replied. Williams nodded and leaned back in his chair. Okay, reconvene in five. Chapter 6 Okay. Is everyone back on the line? Williams asked through the speaker. Stevens nodded, swallowing a sip of water. Yes, Mr. President, he replied. We're all here. Good. Let's continue, Williams said, and there was a shuffle of papers through the phone. Now that we've covered supplies and basic necessities, I want to hear about our military capabilities. What is the current status of our force? Stevens and Kersey shared a pointed look, and then the general said, Mr. President, I don't really know how else to put it other than, uh, it's a complete and total clusterfuck. By all means, General, Williams said dryly. Don't feel like you have to sugarcoat it for me. Stevens sighed. My apologies, Mr. President, he said, rubbing his forehead. But that is a 100% accurate statement. Our forces are a complete mess, and there's no real easy way to fix it. While I believe your assessment, Williams said slowly, would you humor me and walk me through it? The general took a deep breath, clasping his hands on the table in front of him. Of course, he replied. 
The Texas virus, or whatever the official name is, targeted everyone with A-type blood. So, right off the bat, we lost 40% of our fighting force. It was indiscriminate, taking out privates all the way up to generals and everything in between. On top of that, we have lost tens of thousands in battle, even before we invaded Seattle. He shook his head. Securing the small towns in Kansas and the debacle at Kansas City hit us hard. We also had a fair number of defections as well, people who weren't exactly thrilled with our retreat strategy. Combine all that with the incredibly fast speed this hit us with, and our command structure is a complete mess. He sighed. On top of that, there are a fair number of those in command positions who aren't suited for this type of warfare. They've spent their entire careers facing a completely different kind of enemy, and some just haven't adjusted to this kind of warfare. As a result, some perished in battle, and others have had their command relieved because their unwillingness to change tactics got people killed. That doesn't sound ideal, Williams commented, sounding tired. Stevens shook his head. It isn't, but there's more, he continued. At the moment, we don't have access to personnel records, so we don't know who was in line for a promotion or not. We've also had a fair number of discharged vets joining the ranks again, because if there ever was an all-hands-on-deck moment, it's this one. If they could document the prior rank, we just went ahead and reinstated them at that rank. Those who couldn't were relegated to private status, though of course that did open the door to cosplayers. I'm sorry, cosplayers? Williams asked, voice mystified. Kersey leaned forward. Yes, Mr. President, he said. Are you familiar with comic book conventions, where people would dress up as their favorite superhero? That's cosplaying. Yes, Captain, I'm tracking now, Williams replied flippantly. So some people out there took this opportunity to live out their military fantasies. These people showed up in combat fatigues with a rifle and you let them in. Stevens took a deep breath. Frankly, we needed guns, and people to use them, he explained. There were some we suspected of being cosplayers, so we had people watch them carefully. Have there been any incidents involving this group? Williams asked. The general tilted his head back and forth. Some, he admitted. But not more than the usual rate of incidents among enlisted men. Still, the president said, drawing out the word. I would like you to keep an eye on it, if you wouldn't mind. On that point, Miss Hill, do we have access to the military database? I believe we do, Mr. President, Whitney replied. I know that we have a lot on our plates, with some issues like food and preventing a nuclear meltdown taking precedent, Williams said, and paused to wait for everyone's light chuckling. However, we need to do a full census of the military. Find out who we have, cross-check it with the military database and get the structure of our military back in order. Kersey nodded, leaning forward. If I might add to that, he cut in, I think we should do a census of everyone, civilians included. We not only need to know who's here, but we need to know what they can do. We're not just setting up a military stronghold. We are actively rebuilding society. As a result, we're going to need everything a society has, from emergency services all the way down to cooks. To be blunt, grunts are a dime a dozen but someone who knows how to properly prepare a steak is a rarity and should be treated like royalty. Now we just need to get some cattle farmers to raise us some animals, Adams added. Stevens laughed. And a butcher to carve it up properly, he said. And a truck driver to get it from point A to point B, Whitney added, chuckling. And a mechanic to make sure the truck works properly, John added through his own laughter. David shook his head with a grin and an AC repairman to make sure the truck is properly cooled. The laughter died out, the cold reality of the situation sinking in. The structures of civilization had survived the assault, but the inner workings of society had crumbled to death and gore, and nothing was going to be as easy as one step. Just having a stake contained so many steps. General Stevens, Williams said finally, clearing his throat. It would appear as though you have one hell of a massive undertaking on your hands. I would suggest appointing someone, civilian or military, to head up this portion of the operation. Might I suggest Captain Galvin? 
John piped up. By all accounts, he worked very well with the civilian administrator on the Seattle Stadium, so this would just be an expansion of his duties from the last month. Stevens and Kersey both nodded emphatically at each other. I have absolutely no objection to that whatsoever, the general agreed. I can speak to him about the job after we wrap up here. If you and John feel like he's up to the job, consider it his, Williams confirmed. Stevens nodded. I'll give you an update this evening. Thank you, General, Williams replied. Before we move on to the next topic, I have a question for Captain Kersey. Kersey's brow furrowed. Yes, Mr. President? he asked. Captain, in light of your actions in Spokane and Seattle, Williams began, and the fact that our command structure has been decimated and is in desperate need of people experienced in this kind of warfare, how would you feel about being a general? The room fell silent, and Kersey stared at Stevens, blinking rapidly and then glancing to Bretts, who grinned widely. Kersey opened his mouth and then closed it again, at a loss for words. He finally managed to find his voice, stammering, Well, Mr. President, he let out a deep whoosh of breath. That is the most humbling offer that has ever been extended my way. Well, son, you have a mind for this kind of warfare, Williams explained, and we need people like you in decision-making positions. Now, I fully realize this would probably set a record for fastest promotion from sergeant to general, but I think we can all agree these aren't ordinary times. Kersey stared down into his lap for a moment, and then looked to Stevens, who smiled and gave him a thumbs up. He licked his lips and then cleared his throat. First off, Kersey began hoarsely, thank you for thinking so highly of me, sir. I joined the military because I wanted to make a difference for the people of this nation. With what you just said, I feel like my decision was justified. That said, I would love to. He took a deep breath. However, for the moment, I must decline. Bretts let out a small noise of surprise, and Stevens' eyes widened. May I ask why, Captain? Williams asked, clearly confused. Kersey swallowed hard. Well, sir, for as long as I can remember, every time General Stevens here says he's working on a plan, I go ahead and pencil myself in for some new PTSD. Everyone laughed on both sides of the call, and he shook his head, smiling to himself. In all seriousness, though, he continued, sobering, I feel like I can do more good in the field than in a war room especially now that we have Seattle secured. Captain, it takes one hell of a man to turn down a promotion like this, and especially turn it down in favor of going back out into harm's way, Williams commended. Not only do you have my utmost respect, you also have my promise that as long as I'm in charge of this country, my offer stands. Kersey nodded firmly. Thank you, Mr. President, he said sincerely. And depending on what General Stevens runs by me after the meeting, I may have a different answer for you this evening. Williams burst into laughter, backed up by the others. Well, getting back on track, he finally said. Now that we have this foothold, how do we bring new people into the fold? How do we let them know we're here? Traditional media isn't going to work, Whitney pointed out. Because even if we somehow got them up and running, nobody is going to be tuning in. We can certainly let our caravan teams know, John cut in, and they can spread it directly. I like that idea, Whitney mused, but it's not exactly feasible to expect survivors in Georgia or Florida to make a cross-country journey to a safe zone. I don't know, John replied. We run out of coffee in here and I'll consider it. I think we all would, she agreed with a chuckle. Kersey cocked his head. What if we made it so people don't have to make it all the way here on their own? He asked. I mean, we control the rail lines from here to North Platte, Nebraska, don't we? It wouldn't take many men to set up a secure area for people to rest until the train came back. Stevens nodded, pointing at him. The depot at North Platte still had plenty of fuel, he said. We could keep a single line running back and forth for months. I like that idea, Williams said. Let's start game planning it. Figure out what it would take to make it happen. It's not a huge priority, but I would like it on the list. Stevens scribbled on his scrap paper. Consider it done, sir, he said. Come on, people, Williams declared. Let's think outside the box here. How else can we spread the word about Seattle? David stood up from his seat and stood next to the table, leaning towards the phone. I have an idea, sir, he said. 
It's not the most efficient, but it pays dividends in the long run. All right, let's hear it, the president replied. Well, a lot of survivalists use ham radio to chat with one another, and there's a good chance that some of the survivor communities have access to one as well, David explained. It's going to be tedious, but we can send out messages to every frequency and continue trying until we reach people. If we manage to find a few, then they can spread it to the others they know. We can also set up a dedicated frequency where people can tune in to get up-to-date information. This isn't going to yield instant results, but long-term, it should work. That's what I'm talking about, Williams replied. How do you propose we go about implementing this? David shrugged. First off, we need to locate ham radios, he said. Talk with Captain Galvin in the stadium, Whitney piped up. I'm pretty certain they have a setup already. He smiled. Thank you, I'll do that, he said. There was a moment of silence, and then David took his seat again. Okay, Williams finally spoke up. Doesn't seem like there are any other ideas, but I think we have enough to get started on. I believe everybody has their immediate tasks, but I want to take a moment to brainstorm about the next phase of rebuilding society, and what we might need to focus on. Never know when you might have a brilliant idea, so might as well get ourselves thinking on it. So, who wants to start us out? I think once we get through the next few months and get ourselves on solid footing, John began, we're going to have to think about bringing back in a normal economy. Having an emergency community-based approach to things is fine for a while, but it won't take long for people to want to be rewarded for going above and beyond what's asked of them. So we need to be thinking of how to bring in some form of currency. Why wouldn't the dollar work? The president asked. It served us well for a couple of centuries now. Because there is way too much of it out there, just ripe for the picking, John explained. The last thing we want is to have adventurous types leaving the safe zone to rob a bank in Portland and flood our economy with bills. We need to create something from scratch so that we can control it to make sure things don't go haywire. Williams grunted softly. That's an understandable concern, he mused. As much as it would pain me to be the president that presided over the demise of the dollar, we have to do what's best for the community. So, what else? I think when we get the results of the census, Whitney cut in, if there are people in the military with special skills, they need to be allowed to leave service to pursue that. I was under the impression we were already going to reassign vital personnel to civilian roles, Adams replied gruffly. For stuff like farming and doctors, absolutely, Whitney explained. I'm talking about secondary things, like carpentry or mechanics. Things that aren't going to make or break the community, but certainly things that will increase the livability of it. We should also help those who want to set up storefronts, so that we can really get a thriving economy going again. The last thing we want is to force people into jobs they hate, and control every aspect of it. That's only going to last for so long, and having that would potentially alienate the civilians who come here. We need this place to feel like a home, not a military-occupied war zone. Excellent points, Miss Hill, Williams commended. Anybody else? Kersey cleared his throat. We need to put someone in charge of entertainment, he suggested. Adams barked a laugh and then quickly cut himself off when he realized nobody else joined in. Apologies, I thought that was a joke, he admitted. I'm very serious about this, General, the captain insisted. We're going to need things to keep everyone's mind off of the massive pile of work that needs to be done, as well as the danger that is going to be at our doorsteps for years to come. We're going to need a team of curators to bring in every bit of media that we can find while going through businesses and homes. CDs, movies, video games, books, board games, anything and everything that can be entertaining. On top of that, we should also think about what Captain Galvin did in the stadium, instituting community classes like yoga and art projects. Not only does it keep people occupied, but it brings them closer together. Another good point, future General Kersey, Williams said. The captain rolled his eyes and chuckled to himself as Bretts patted him on the shoulder teasingly. I think we have more than enough to go on for the time being, Williams declared. Let's break and reconvene at 0700 Seattle time. Does that work for everyone? There was a murmuring of the affirmative from both sides of the call. Fantastic, the president said. Let's start working on the most pressing issues, and General Stevens, I'll look forward to hearing your plan for our ammunition problem. Stevens nodded sharply. I'll do my best not to disappoint you, sir. The line went dead, and the quartet sat in silence for a moment. Finally, Kersey turned in his seat and cocked his head, smirking at Stevens. Okay, 
You want to clue me in on what I'm going to be doing instead of sitting in a cushy office like you? The general barked a laugh and leaned back in his chair, a playful grin on his face. Tell me, Kersey, have you ever been to Idaho? Chapter 7 Idaho? Kersey stammered, shaking his head, eyes wide. What in the almighty hell is in Idaho that can't be found here? Stevens held out his hand. Brits, can you hand me that magazine on the shelf next to you there? He asked. The corporal looked behind him and found a magazine on the shelf with a buxom blonde on the cover, holding a machine gun way too large for her body. He handed it over, and Stevens tossed it on the table. Kersey raised an eyebrow. I mean, if she's there, I'll take the next flight out, he joked. You and me both, soldier, Stevens agreed, but flip to page 47. The captain opened the magazine, licking his thumb and flipping through the pages. He reached the right one and began to read out loud. How Boise, Idaho became one of the biggest gun manufacturing towns in the world. He dropped the book, staring at the general with wide eyes. Seriously? Absolutely, Stevens exclaimed excitedly. They have over a dozen major manufacturers there, all set up and ready to roll, machines as well as raw material. Now at some point we'll have to replenish the raw materials, but having the manufacturing capability would go a long way towards sustaining our military. Kersey couldn't help but chuckle to himself. So, what do you want me to do? he asked, spreading his arms. Before Stevens could answer, Brett stood up and stepped next to his captain. What do you want us to do? he corrected. Kersey nodded at him with a smile. I need you to assemble a team and parachute into Boise, Stevens continued. Figure out what the situation on the ground is, make contact with the locals if there are any, and secure the factories. The captain laughed. Oh, is that all? he asked, sarcasm evident in his tone. How many are you sending me in with? Four hundred? Five hundred? Ten, Stevens replied, deadpan, including you. Kersey rubbed his forehead, a horror laugh escaping his throat. You want ten of us to drop in and secure a dozen sites? Why only ten of us? Bretz asked in disbelief. Stevens shook his head. Because that's all the fuel we can spare for the airplane he explained. So unless someone wants to hang on to the wing... Kowalski, Kersey and Bretz blurted at the same time, and the general chuckled. Please don't put Kowalski on the wing, he pleaded, pressing his palms together. Don't dare him to do it either, because I know he will. Okay, Brett said petulantly, and Kersey feigned a pout. When they were done with their little show, Kersey asked, so, when can we expect reinforcements? Realistically, Stevens took a deep breath. Ten to fifteen days. Brett's crossed his arms. Oh, is that all? They're going to have to come via surface roads, Stevens replied. And there's not exactly a direct route they'll be able to take. Plus, and this may sound harsh, if the plants have been gutted, burned down, or there are other complications, we need to know that, so we don't waste our extremely limited resources on this excursion. Kersey nodded, leaning back in his chair. That makes sense, he admitted. So, I guess if the situation on the ground looks bad, Brett strolled, we'll just hitchhike back? The captain smirked. Or we could vacation Boise, he suggested playfully. I hear it's nice in about six months after the winter goes away. Don't worry, Stevens said, putting up his hands. I'll have a plan in place for extraction, if things go south. Kersey smacked his knees, letting out a deep breath. Well, already regretting not taking your job, General, he declared, and they shared a laugh as he got to his feet. But seeing as how this is our mission now, when do we leave? Twenty-four hours, Stevens replied. I know you've been sleeping like shit this week. So we're going to set your team up with rooms at the hotel just across from the stadium so you can get rested. Kersey nodded. All right, I'll go assemble my team, he replied. The general raised an eyebrow. 
You know you can just tell me who you want and I'll get them here, right? He asked. We're about to embark on yet another suicide mission, the captain explained. I feel like it's my duty to inform my lucky participants in person. Stevens nodded in appreciation. I understand, he said. In the meantime, I'll make sure you have everything you could possibly need for your loadout. Appreciate that, General, Kersey said, and headed for the door. Before he left, he turned to David, who'd stepped aside with his stack of papers. David, it's been a pleasure working with you these last few weeks, he said, extending his hand. The communications expert shook and smiled. Likewise, Captain, he replied. It has been awe-inspiring to watch you work. I wouldn't go quite that far, Kersey replied, chuckling. I will say, however, that I admire the fact that you are sticking on a heading up the community outreach program, among other things. David shrugged. This is my home now, too, he pointed out. So I gotta do what I can to make it succeed. You don't let the general here give you any shit, you hear? Kersey said, waving a hand at a smirking Stevens. David grinned. You come back from Idaho in one piece, you hear? He replied. Kersey gave him a nod and led Brett's from the room, headed for Benny's chopper. Well, David, Stevens declared, I guess you have officially been passed off to me. Are you ready to get started building your radio network? The communications expert nodded, practically vibrating with excitement. Absolutely, sir, he replied. Let's get to it. Chapter 8 Kersey looked down at the scout and sweeper teams below the helicopter as Benny flew them north towards Burlington. Man, this shit is gonna go on for years, ain't it? The pilot asked. Kersey nodded. Afraid so, buddy, he admitted. But this kind of action up here shouldn't last more than a few weeks. Then the real fun begins, right? Benny asked. The captain laughed. I think we have different definitions of fun, he said dryly. So, where are you boys off to next? The pilot asked. Or is it top secret and all that jazz? Kersey chuckled, a mischievous twinkle in his eye. Not sure who you would tell, he said. But let's be honest. Do you really think people would take you as a credible source? Depends on the topic, Benny shot back playfully. If I'm dispensing knowledge about military operations, probably not. If I'm letting them know which rundown diner waitress will give them a blue plate special in the walk-in freezer if you tip them right, then probably so. Kersey burst out laughing. Why do I get the feeling that you've led an interesting life, buddy? He asked. Oh, I've got some stories that will haunt your dreams, Captain, Benny assured him. Kersey shook his head. I have no doubt that you do, he agreed. But to get back to less disturbing topics, we're going to be heading out to Idaho, Boise, to be specific. Well, hell, the pilot burst out. I lived in Boise for a while after the war. The captain blinked at him in shock. You don't strike me as the Idaho type, he admitted. The I'd bang a ho type, but not Idaho. You're right about both, Benny replied, laughing. So how in the hell did you end up there? Kersey asked. The pilot shrugged. Man, it was right after getting back from the war, he replied. Made the near-fatal mistake of falling for the first woman who paid me any attention. Couple months into things, she convinced me to pick up and move to Boise so she could pursue her dreams of being a farmer or rancher or something she was woefully unqualified to do. Apparently, she thought growing a pot plant in her closet made her a farmer. Come on now, Kersey cut in playfully. Growing pot in your closet is a skill, after all. Benny nodded. Wholeheartedly agree, he admitted. But if you smoked what she was growing, you would know she didn't have that skill. So what happened? Kersey asked. The pilot took a deep breath. Well, we got out there, and of course I was the only one with money. So it was my name on the apartment lease, he began. To her credit, she managed to find a job on a farm pretty quick. Unfortunately, she lasted about three days before saying it wasn't for her. A week later, she hopped a bus and headed home, leaving me with a year-long lease. You know you can break those, right? 
Kersey asked, raising an eyebrow. Benny rolled his eyes. Oh, of course I know, he replied. But it was a great excuse to make her lazy ass catch a bus than go back with her. Sounds like you made the right call, man, Kersey said, and they shared a laugh. The bridge fortifications approaching Burlington came into view, having been improved with elevator gunner nests on either side made out of painter's scaffolding. Benny hovered over the supercenter and set the chopper down in the middle of the lot. As the blade slowed, Sergeant Copeland approached the bird. Copeland! Benny exclaimed as he hopped to the ground. The sergeant offered him a wide grin. Hey, buddy, he said. Wasn't expecting a resupply today. Well, I had some special cargo that I felt needed to be delivered personally, Benny explained, and stepped aside as the other two came around the chopper. Copeland shook his head. Ah, oh, hell, here comes trouble, he declared. You don't know the half of it, Kersey admitted with a grin, and they shook hands. Come on, we got a nice little relaxation spot set up, the sergeant offered, waving for them to follow him. You want me to call anybody else up here? Before Kersey could respond, somebody yelled from the front of the supercenter. Holy shit! Is that Captain Kersey? Live and in the flesh? Kowalski called. The captain laughed and shook his head. I think Kowalski is going to be more than enough, he said. The sniper approached, a spring in his step as he appraised the duo. And Brett's, he exclaimed. You're looking pretty good there. Got a nice tan going on, which is impressive given the cloud-covered days. How long did you have to bake to get that kind of color? Longer than I'd like to admit, Brett's replied dryly. You might as well join us, Kowalski, Copeland suggested. The good captain here is bringing us some new trouble to get into. The five men headed into the supercenter, where several soldiers were walking about and hanging around. Some snacked on junk food, others lounged around on makeshift cots between the registers. Hey, if the two of you are here, Kowalski asked without turning around, then what kind of trouble is Baker and Mason getting into? Kersey and Brett shared a concerned glance, and the captain cleared his throat. Baker got himself a bit of a concussion, so he's resting up, he said thickly. Mason... There was an awkward silence, and Kowalski stopped walking, turning around. He swallowed hard, shaking his head. That's a damn shame, man, he said quietly, in a rare moment of seriousness. Mason was a good kid. Yeah, he was, Kersey agreed. Copeland gave them a moment of silence and then waved for them to follow him. Come on, we're almost there, he said. They entered an area at the back of the store that looked like a summer backyard cookout. There were several tables and outdoor lounge chairs spread out in a circle, with a charcoal grill in the middle. A soldier stood there, grilling up some canned meat with a smile. Hey, Sergeant, he greeted. Just about got these done if you're looking for a hot meal. Bread's a little stale, but it's still good. Copeland nodded and held out his hand for the tongs. Appreciate it, soldier, he said. I can cover it from here. Why don't you go take ten? We have some things to discuss. The soldier nodded, handing over the tongs and inclining his head towards the captain, before sauntering off towards the front of the store. Anybody for some canned meat burgers? Copeland asked checking the patties and flipping them. Everyone nodded and took seats around the patio table, and Kowalski took up a stack of plates, passing out the burgers as Copeland removed them from the grill. Okay, Captain, Copeland finally said as he sat down with his own plate. Lay it on us. What sort of suicide mission are we going on this time? Kersey took a bite of his sandwich, holding up a finger as he chewed and swallowed. How do you boys feel about conquering Boise, Idaho? He finally asked. Copeland raised an eyebrow. Conquer Boise? He asked. How many of us are they sending? Ten, the captain replied, and then dove back into his sandwich. Yeah, that should be plenty, Kowalski quipped, leaning back in his chair. The group laughed, and then Copeland finally rubbed his forehead. 
You serious? he asked. Kersey nodded. Yep, serious on both counts, he confirmed. There's a huge ammo shortage, and General Stevens discovered that Boise is one of the gun manufacturing capitals of the world. Our job is to go in, secure the factories, make contact with local survivors. If there are any, Kowalski interrupted through a mouthful of fried meat and bread. Bretz clapped his friend on the back. You know our luck, Kowalski, he declared. There's going to be survivors. The sniper swallowed. Hopefully they're friendly this time, he added. Again, you know our luck, Bretz replied, rolling his eyes. Reinforcements? Copeland asked. Kersey swallowed his last bite of food. Coming on the ground, he replied. So, realistically, two weeks out? At least we'll get a two-week vacation from the rebuild, the sergeant pointed out. Kowalski raised a hand. Can we make it three weeks? he asked. I really don't want to be around for the corpse removal phase of things. My job is to put them down, not pick them back up. It's rare that I agree with Kowalski, Copeland began, jerking a thumb at the sniper. But I'm with him. So, when do we leave? Kowalski asked. Kersey sat back in his chair. We fly out tomorrow afternoon, he explained. General Stevens has us set up in a hotel near the stadium, so we can get properly rested. I'm totally ordering room service, the sniper declared. Hell, man. I just want to sleep for twelve hours in a soft bed and not be disturbed, Copeland moaned, but then raised a hand. Wait, we get our own rooms, right? he asked. Kersey chuckled. Don't worry, he said. If we don't, I'll make sure Kowalski bunks with someone else. Gotta be my sniping buddy, Wade, Kowalski said, raising a fist. Room service and picking off zombies from the top floor. Now that sounds relaxing. Speaking of Wade, Copeland cut in, you know who you want to be on this little excursion? Kersey nodded. I've been giving it some thought, he said. Need people I know can work under pressure. Well, and Kowalski. The group laughed, and the sniper playfully gave his captain a middle finger before shoving the rest of his sandwich into his mouth. I figure the four of us, Kersey continued, plus Johnson, if he can be spared from the barricade here. Copeland nodded. I can arrange it, he said. So, who else are you thinking? Wade has to be on the team for sure, Kowalski cried, near choking as he struggled to swallow his giant mouthful. He coughed and smashed his fist into his chest, finally clearing his airway before continuing. Can't be the only sniper in the group. Looks like we have a vote for Wade, Copeland said. I'd like to bring along Dawson, Mac, and Mars, Kersey nodded. That gets us to nine. Bretts raised a hand. I don't think Baker would forgive us if we left him behind for cleanup duty, he suggested. Last I heard, he was still in the infirmary, the captain replied, brow furrowing. Don't worry, I'm sure I can break him out, the corporal said. Kersey chuckled. Just make sure to leave survivors, he replied. We're kind of short-handed. No promises, Bretts said with a grin. The group chuckled and sat around in a rare moment of silence, enjoying the relaxation before the chaos that lay ahead. The End Up next, the action shifts to El Paso as the massive zombie horde marches towards the unsuspecting survivors in the El Paso Creeping Death series. <laughs> 